All right. Welcome, everyone, to today, today's Google Search Central Office Hours Hangout. My name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate at Google. And part of what I do is these office hours, where people can join in and ask questions around their website and web search. And we can try to find some answers. And wow, lots of people joining today. Lots of questions submitted. This is good. Cool. Um, Bunch of things were already submitted. Uh, but if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're welcome to jump on in. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, I have actually two questions. So first one is about uh, changing website. So one of our clients, they changed their website. They moved the website from WordPress to Drupal. Fortunately, we are keeping the same URL, like WordPress. So the URL structure will not be changed. The only thing they are going to change the design of the site and content, they are going to add more content. Now, the question is the ranking they have uh, for those URL uh, at this moment. If they make this content change and design change, will that affect the ranking? It can, yes. I mean, anytime you, you change your website, then that's something that should be reflected in, in your rankings, right? So if you, if you add text to your pages, if you remove text, if you change the internal linking, uh, if you change the, the layout so that you have different things as headings and titles, then that's something that should be reflected in search. Uh, so keeping the URLs the same, I think, makes it a lot easier because we, we just can keep a lot of the signals already, but we still need to look at the content, like what, what is on these pages, how, how they're linked between each other. And it's not, it's not the case that like, it will always be a negative change. Uh, a lot of people do these kind of migrations because they want to improve things, because they, it's like, well, I noticed my internal linking is bad with my old CMS, and I moved to a CMS that does internal linking a lot better, so that helps me to kind of get my site crawled better, for example. And the next question is about uh, backlink. So how does Google uh, like weight the, measure the weight of a backlink? Like uh, some people get business listing. Some people get backlink from the content. Some people get backlink from the regional site, like .com.au. Some people get backlink from .com site. Does Google differentiate that, OK, this they are Australian site. They are getting backlink from .com.au. We are giving more importance because they are getting .com.au. Or is it same getting backlink from .com and .com.au? And what about the other type of backlink, business listing, or getting backlink from content? That gets really complicated. So um, <laughs> I, I mean, what we wouldn't differentiate is just because they're different top-level domains. So okay. it's like an AU site and a .com or a UK site or whatever. It's not that we would say they have different weights for individual types of links. But we do try to differentiate uh, by, by the type of link that it is and to figure out what, what is its importance with regards to the context that, that it provides. Uh, is it something that tells us a lot about the page that it's linking to, or is it something that is is more like, oh, by the way, we're also here kind of thing, which which is more like, well, like, OK, we saw it, and that's OK. Thank you, John. Hey, John. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I have a question about archiving. Um, <clears throat> so we have a site with a large number of press release pages. Uh, these are quite old, right? From uh, maybe from 2015, and, and maybe even older. And the thing is, they have accumulated a large amount of backlinks, uh, but they don't get any traffic. But these the, the, the quite high dom authoritative domains are pointing to them. But now we want to clean them up because they are taking up the real estate, or or at least they, it becomes a bit too big there. Now the thing is, so I was thinking of okay, we can move it to an archive. Um, but I still would like to benefit from the SEO power these pages have built up over time. So is, is there a way to do this cleverly? So basically, so moving them indeed to an archive, for example, a subdirectory, uh, but then still, let's say, benefit from the SEO power? Yeah, I mean, you, you can just redirect them to a different part of your site. Mm -hmm. like if, you, if you have an archive section for this kind of older content, which is, is very common, mm -hmm. Uh, then kind of moving the content there and redirecting the URLs there 
that essentially tells us to forward the links there. Yeah, but I, we were also thinking because a lot of them, so they need to be there still for, let's say, uh, um, uh, legal purposes, for example. Um, but I still would like to say, okay, you know what? The, the crawler uh, doesn't need to access these these folders for me all the time. So I was thinking about disallowing that folder. But will will disallow a, a subdirectory? Will this also mean that the buildup as show power will not will be ignored from then on that that point onwards? Uh, because in a sense, I was thinking like this: what you say is to the to the crawler, hey, you don't have to uh, crawl this this folder anymore. But I don't think we say ignore the uh, SEO, build up SEO power, right? Or do I see this wrong? Um, so probably we would already automatically crawl less if we recognize that they're less relevant for your site. Okay. So it's not, not the case that you need to block it completely. Uh, if, if you were to block it completely with robots text, we would not know what is on its pages. So. Okay. Uh, essentially, when when there are lots of external links pointing to a page that is blocked by robots text, then sometimes we can still show that page in the search results, but we'll show it as like with, with a title based on the links and a text that says, "Oh, we don't know what is actually here." Uh, and uh, if if that page that is being linked to is something that is just referring to more content within your website, we wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So we can't kind of like indirectly forward those links to, to your primary content. Uh, so that's something where it's like if, if you see that these pages are important enough that people are linking to them, then I would try to avoid blocking them by robots text. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing kind of to keep in mind also is uh, that these kind of press release pages, things that collect over time, mm -hmm. usually the type of links that they attract are very I don't know, temp time limited kind of thing, where yes. a, a new site will link to it once. And uh, then it's like when, when you look at the number of links, it, it might look like, oh, there are lots of links here. But these are like really old news articles, which are in the archives of those news sites, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also kind of a sign, well, like they have links, but those links are not extremely useful because uh -huh. it's. Like, so so irrelevant in, in the meantime. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate your, your time. Thanks. Sure. Hey, hi, John. Uh, I wanted to know something uh, very basic about copied content. Uh, so as we all know, the copied content is against Google, Google guidelines and is also not a good practice in general. So I just wanted to know how Google determines if a particular piece of content is copied or not, and who is the actual original source for that content. How do you determine if it's copied? I, just, I, I think it's, it's kind of tricky in, in some aspects. In some aspects, it's, it's really easy, because if you take a piece of text and you search for it, then exact, if exactly the same text is on the rest of the web or on other pages, then that's a pretty clear sign that this is copy content. Um, but it's also something where it's not by, by default so for example, if you have copied content that is more along the lines of boilerplate text, like you have, I don't know, a legal disclaimer on the bottom of your site, uh, which is something that you have across all of your pages of your site, then technically that's copied content. But practically, for us, that's not, not really an issue, uh, because these are things that people are generally not searching for. It's not that they're searching for the legal disclaimer and they want to find your site. It's more uh, they're looking for your primary content. And with in that, that regard, it's something where we try to kind of weigh the copied content appropriately, um, but also kind of like still look at the rest of your site. Uh, so I, I don't know actually if that helps with, with regards to your question. So that's kind of like the thing is like it's, it's easy to recognize that there's copied content on these pages, but it's hard to figure out what we should do uh, about that copied content. Uh, with regards to the author or the, the owner of that content, I, I don't think we 
go and make any judgment in that regard because that's that's really tricky like we can't determine who is the owner and sometimes the the person who wrote it first is not uh, the one for example that is the most relevant so we we see this a lot of times for example with our own blog posts uh, where we will write a blog post and uh, we'll put the information we want to share on our blog post. And someone will copy that content, and they will add a lot of extra information around it. It's like, here's what Google really wants to tell you. And it's like reading between the lines, kind of the secret to Google's algorithms. And when someone is searching, it's like, maybe they want to find original source. Maybe they want to find kind of this more elaborate, uh, I don't know, exploration of, of the content itself. So just because something is original doesn't mean that it's the one that is the most relevant when someone is looking for that information. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the long explanation. Thank you. All right. Anything else before we jump into the questions? I submitted my question, but I can jump in now if that's fine. Okay. Um, so if you recall, I'm checking in again about our domain migration. Um, we migrated our domain at the beginning of August, had almost total traffic loss after connecting in a few of these sessions. Uh, it was indicated that Google Engineering was able to make a partial fix for us. That was towards the end of September. Um, and then we did start to see slow, but, but some recovery. We were eking our way to almost 50%. Um, after about four months and right before the Broadcore update. And now we dropped to basically back where we were post domain migration. So my question is if you think it's possible that the partial fix that we were able to get via the engineering team possibly got reverted or just otherwise how we should try to make sense of what happened with the Broadcore update. We're of course trying to look through that lens just neutrally and try to think about what we can do to improve the site. But with where we were before the domain migration loss and where we are now, it's a little hard to not think that we're still just dealing with domain migration issues. And if that seems likely to you and any advice from here? Um, I. I don't know. I, I think it's kind of awkward that uh, the, these kind of issues pop up with domain migrations. So I'm sorry that you're struggling with this. Um, I, I think with, with the issue that you're seeing now, I don't think that would be related to kind of the fix in the domain migration being reverted or kind of being blocked. Um, my, my assumption there is that it's more that the, the general core update is also affecting your site. And it's like this combination of those remaining lingering issues plus the core update is essentially what you're seeing there. Um, so I, but I, I will definitely take a look with, with the team to see if, if there's something more specific that's going on there that we need to watch out for. Uh, so that's. Yeah, I, I don't know. So one of the things that we ended up doing specifically af after running through your issue is trying to figure out how, how many other sites might be affected by these kind of uh, site migration issues. And it seems like it's extremely rare, uh, which doesn't really help you that much. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's like a special case kind of thing. But uh, at least that a little bit. Uh, calming on my side, but it's something where I still think we we should be able to do a better job handling these these kind of migrations and not run into issues where people have to contact us essentially personally uh, with regards to kind of I don't know getting things back to normal again. But it so if, if I remember correctly, your site is, is about uh, kind of university reviews. Uh, yeah, it's mostly focused on online education. Yeah, I I could imagine that the core update is something that you might want to look into there. It's like the oh, the post that we, we have. We are. <laughs> yeah, and I I know there there are a bunch of other SEOs that have kind of dug into all of those details of what what you need to watch out for, uh, with uh, expertise, authority, trust, those those kind of topics. 
so I would I would definitely look into that. Um, but uh, usually, when when it comes to core updates, it's something where it's not just one small thing that you can fix and it gets better. Uh, it's it's more of a long term approach that you have to kind of look at there. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're doing that internally, and we've been working with Marie Haynes and Glenn Gabe and some other SEOs. Um, it just, it's, it's hard to not feel like it's our domain migration that is um, still having an extremely large impact on us. And I'm honestly not sure what else to do except to check in here when yeah. I can. No, I, I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine to, to keep pushing for this, because it's, uh, I mean, I, I try to watch what, what is happening with those discussions internally. Uh, but it's it's also good to see kind of from from the external side like oh it's it's still a problem uh, so we still need still to put problem it. yeah okay okay thank yeah. you I, I'll definitely double check though specifically around the the core update if there's something that might be kind of uniquely happening with your site that maybe we need to fix in that regard okay thank you sure okay uh, let me run through some of the submitted questions. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to jump on in as well. Um, in Search Console, we noticed that our pages are marked as crawled, currently not indexed. Looking into the detail, we see that Google has found our user declared canonical, but then picked a completely different and unrelated page for its Google selected canonical. Uh, any idea why this might be? So usually, this kind of situation is something where I'd need to look at the details. So it's uh, a bit tricky without having any URLs there. Uh, one, one thing you could perhaps do is post in the uh, help forum and try to provide some details, some examples there, so that the experts there can take a look and maybe give you some tips or escalate that to the search team if needed. Uh, one of the Places where I have seen this uh, happen is when a website is set up in a way that it's hard for us to tell which parts of a URL are actually relevant. Uh, so that could be, uh, for example, if you have a number of different websites that all have the same backend system and the same URLs lead to the same content across the different domains, uh, then it could be that our systems say, well, Actually, the domain name isn't so relevant here. We will pick like any one of these domains as the canonical for this kind of URL pattern. Uh, it could also be that you have a URL structure that maybe something in the path or in the URL parameters is deemed as being irrelevant to our systems. Uh, in, in that sense, it's not like irrelevant in that the content is bad kind of thing, but it's irrelevant in that when we look at a number of different parameters, we see always the same content. And therefore, our systems kind of learn over time that actually this URL pattern uh, is something that doesn't lead to unique content, but rather we can pick one of the URLs that is kind of in this group of uh, URL patterns and pick that as a canonical. And that happens regardless of what the actual content is on individual pages once we've learned that pattern. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easier for us to kind of deal with canonicalization without having to crawl the whole site and like get stuck in all of these URL patterns that essentially lead to the same content. And in, in a case like that, it could happen that you have a URL structure that for a large part leads to similar content where we get confused, but there are individual pieces in there where which does do lead to uh, unique content. And then it could happen like this, that our systems say, well, all of this is irrelevant. We will pick one here. And we don't realize that actually, well, this one here is kind of an exception. Uh, so if, if you think that might be the case in, in your situation, um, one thing you can do is try to figure out, is like, do you perhaps have this kind of pattern of URLs that all lead to the same content? Uh, you could do something like look at your server logs to see which URLs are being crawled. And based on those, try those URLs out in your browser and see, is this something that is all leading to the same content? Uh, is Google somehow getting stuck with URL parameters or with crawling of the website? And based on that, you can work to um, kind of exclude the discovery of these irrelevant URLs and focus on the ones that you really do want to have in. 
Um, I notice that often when we publish a new article on our site, the article's ranking starts to improve as time goes by. Uh, for example, in this case, it took five months from the date of publication of the article to reach a stable ranking. This happened despite the fact that the article has not changed in five months. Uh, it's the same from the beginning. Uh, so I would expect the article ranking to be the same right away. Obviously, this is not the case. Uh, so what happens on Google's side in the time between publication of a new page and its stabilization and ranking? Um, I, I didn't take a look at that specific example. Uh, but it's, it's very common that it takes some time for our signals to kind of settle down and to uh, better understand what is on a specific page. And this is something that is, is very visible. For example, if you have a new website, then you might publish that new website. And in the beginning, Google might go, oh, it's, it's a new website. We found it. Like If someone is explicitly looking for it, we'll probably show it. Uh, but over time, over a couple of months, we will try to understand, well, what, what is the relevance of this new website? In which regards is it important for the web? And then we'll show it maybe for more and more queries over time. And uh, that's not something where our systems, um, I don't know, it's essentially just something that takes time for us to collect all of the signals that are associated with these pages. And uh, it's not something that can happen from one day to the next. And it can also happen for individual pages as well. So it's not just specific to new websites uh, like that. Um, for some queries, I see Google ranking websites which have a high amount of ad content, which is creating a poor search experience. How is Google dealing with those sites? Uh, it's hard to say without having examples. Uh, but there, there are various things that we do take into account with regards to the user experience side of things. Uh, so on the one hand, we did, I think a couple of years ago, the um, an update where the above-the-fold content is something that we weighed a little bit more. Uh, so that's something where if there's a lot of ad content above the fold, then perhaps it might be affected by that. Uh, there are other updates that uh, have happened in the past with regards to speed. Uh, there's the Core Web Vitals, which is going to be launched, I think, in May with regards to kind of ranking in search results. Uh, which also helps there. Uh, but the, the other thing also to keep in mind is we use a lot of different factors to determine ranking in the search results to try to understand what is relevant uh, for users in individual times. And uh, it can very well happen that a page is extremely relevant in some regards, but still has a really bad user experience. And we will still show it in the search results. And sometimes we show it highly in the search results. So, uh, just because a page has a bad user experience. And if, if we were to take that bad user experience into account, it doesn't mean we would never show that page. Uh, this is something that uh, is, is really common. For example, if you search for a, a website's name, then you would expect to find that website, even if that website is kind of like doing weird things, has a really bad user experience, you would still expect to find that website. And uh, there's a broad range of different uh, kind of kinds of queries and kinds of understanding of relevance uh, that flow into things like that. So uh, with, with that said, it's, it's always possible to find these kind of uh, pages in the search results. It's extremely rare for us to manually go in and say, we will completely remove this website from search so it never shows up for any queries. We usually reserve that specifically uh, for cases where the whole website is essentially irrelevant, where the whole website is just scraping content from the rest of the web, and there's nothing unique of value at all on the website. Then that's something where the web spam team might go in and say, this is a pure spam website. There is nothing of value here. Then we'll remove that from search. Uh, but for everything else, it's kind of like we can still show it. And in some cases, the other factors play a larger role. I think this is also really important because a lot of people don't know everything that they should be doing on the website. They don't know all of the details of what, what is important or what they should not do. Uh, they don't know, like, 
those tricks that they heard from friends, are they kind of like really bad, or are they just kind of bad, or do they kind of work sometimes? And uh, they end up doing lots of weird things. And uh, all of these websites that do things which are kind of suboptimal, where as an expert, you might look at it and say, oh, like they should not be doing this. This is so clearly black hat against the webmaster guidelines. Uh, they might not know, and they might be a legitimate small business, and they just have their website like that. And in cases like that, I think we should definitely still continue to show that website. It's not that like it's completely irrelevant for users. Maybe they're just doing things in ways that uh, they don't know any better. Um, let's see. Updating the design of a website plus a few URL changes. Content remains largely the same, but getting a few updates where necessary. There's about 2,000 URLs. Uh, given the core update is still rolling out, should I hang on for a week or push the Go Live button now? I would just move forward. Uh, so the, the core updates that we do tend to be focused more on kind of like broader changes in the search results. And it's not something where if you make a change right at the same time, then it suddenly clashes and breaks anything. Uh, so in that regard, like I, I would not hold off and kind of like artificially hold myself back. If you're making improvements on your website, and usually if you change things like this across a site, then I would classify that as improvements. And I would just move forward and uh, do those improvements so that they're they're live as early as possible. Thanks, John. Cool. Um, let's see. We changed our website's domain name. The old one's search ranking was decreased to zero. However, the new one's search ranking is much lower than the old site's ranking. Uh, this reminds me of a different question. Um, However, let's see. Some experts said it takes up to six months to achieve original rankings. How can we speed up uh, the SEO results? Some backlinks link to the old site. Do we need to change the links to the new site? Um, yeah, for, for the most part, I, I think well, one of the things I would strongly recommend is just making sure that you're following the, the guidelines that we have, specifically for site moves, uh, the details as much as possible, especially if this site move is still fairly fresh then making sure that you have things like all of the redirects set up so that all of the old content is really moving to the new, con new site. Uh, that's something I would do. I would double check all the settings in Search Console so that you have all of that lined up. Uh, but in our guidelines, we also mention the, the links to the site. And we do mention that it does make sense to get those updated as well. In particular, with the links to the site, we use that for canonicalization. So if we're not sure if we should show the old one or the new one, then if we see that there are lots of links to one of these versions, then that helps us to try to make that decision. Uh, it sounds like canonicalization is less an issue there if you're seeing that there's already no traffic going to the old domain. Uh, but still, I think updating some of those links where you can make sense. Um, we're going to run into the same kind of issue on our side as well. When we did the migration to Google Search Central from Webmaster Central, uh, because it's like I, I think the the Twitter pages or the YouTube uh, main account pages they don't redirect for whatever reasons. Uh, so we're also kind of discussing internally if we should ask people to help update the links, which is kind of weird, but I, I guess everyone has to do that. Um, in general, it can take a while for things to settle down after site migration. Uh, but uh, it should, for the most part, be fairly straightforward. Uh, the one situation where I have seen uh, issues with regards to site migrations, well, I guess the more common one where I've seen issues is when the new domain name, the one that you're moving to, has a really weird history associated with it. Uh, then that's something where it's, it can get tricky for us to understand what, what does this migration mean. Uh, so in particular, if the old domain used to be hosting a lot of web spam content, 
uh, then, or wait, the new domain is hosting a lot of, or was hosting a lot of web spam content, and you move there, then we have all of these kind of spammy signals that are associated with the domain name that you move to, plus the new signals from your old content. And that mix is sometimes hard for us to figure out, like, what, what does this mean? Um, it's, so that's something that you might want to, to look into. In general, if you're moving to a domain, if you're starting a website on a new domain, looking at the domain's history is something I'd still recommend doing. Uh, there are lots of things that you can clean up with regards to kind of taking on a used domain name. Uh, but some things are a lot more time intensive uh, than, than others. So in particular, uh, if a website was deeply involved in web spam and has a lot of really problematic links from across the web, then that's something that you might want to clean up ahead of time, which takes a lot of time. Um, the another situation where you might want to kind of keep in mind that it will take a bit of time is if the old, if the domain that you're moving to uh, used to host a lot of adult content, then we might have that domain in in our safe search list essentially, and. As we see that your content is now hosted there, then that will update automatically. Uh, but it can take a bit of time for us to kind of switch from, oh, we should be filtering this domain using safe search to this is actually a, I don't know, completely normal domain with uh, traditional content, let's call it. So those are kind of the situations that, that I would watch out for. Uh, if I migrate a subdomain, like m.domain to www.domain.com, the site is now responsive, and the mobile version is no longer needed. Should I use a change of address tool in Search Console? Uh, you can use it. You don't need to use it. So the change of address tool in particular helps us when you're moving to a new domain name, because then we can forward those kind of more domain level signals a little bit easier uh, than uh, if we had to do that on a per URL basis. Uh, but if you're moving just between subdomains within the same domain, then that's not something you'd need to do that. It also doesn't cause any problems. So if you've done that in the past and you're like, oh, no, I should revert it, uh, don't worry about that. Um... We're exploring web stories and using Tappable, which we have embedded in our site. Uh, when I test the URL in the Inspect URL tool, it doesn't show up. Um, what, what can we do about it? I don't know what Tappable is, so it's hard for me to say what, what exactly to do there. Web stories are based on AMP pages. Uh, so for web stories, you would use the, the AMP testing tool to see that they, they work well, that the structured data there is, is recognized properly. Uh, so that might be some, something to ch check out. Uh, with regards to whether or not these URLs are indexed, web stories by design are normal AMP pages, like I said. So they can get indexed individually. And they're set up in a way that they're canonical AMP. That means it's not like. Uh, AMP pages that are associated with the rest of your website, where you have the canonical as the traditional HTML page and the AMP HTML alternate version. Uh, for web stories, you only have the AMP version. And essentially, that can get indexed like any other normal content. Uh, we currently don't show web stories in all places, uh, all, all countries, I think. Uh, but we do show AMP content pretty much, I think, in all countries. Uh, so if you have a web story, what will happen is it might be shown in these web story-specific surfaces uh, if you're in one of those countries. But if you're not in one of those countries, it'll be shown in the normal web search results. Uh, so it'll be shown just like any other web page might be. Uh, since it's also a normal web page like any other, you need to think about the usual a uh, SEO uh, aspects there, too. So things like titles and headings and text on the page, uh, alt attributes for images, all of the usual things, they all apply to web stories. It's a bit trickier with web stories because traditionally you want to make it 
kind of uh, visually impressive, which means you don't have this big box of, box of text on these web stories. Uh, but you still need textual content so that we can rank those pages properly. Um, question about AMP. My website is 97% traffic is from desktop users. Should I need to be worried about AMP? Uh, because in the Search Console, I can see some AMP errors on my website. Is, is it worth spending time and effort on to fix those issues uh, since the majority of the traffic is from desktop? Will it impact ranking in the long term? Uh, so AMP pages are responsive. Uh, so essentially, you can use them on desktop, too. It's not something that is purely mobile. Uh, there, there are lots of sites that use AMP as their primary framework for making content, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, so that's something where like, just because you have a lot of desktop users doesn't mean you should not use AMP. Uh, for example, I think the amp.dev site uh, is, is completely written in AMP. And if you look at it in a desktop browser, it looks like a normal website. Uh, with regards to AMP errors, what, what happens with AMP pages when we recognize their errors on these pages is we understand that they're not valid AMP pages. And that means that those pages would not be kept in the AMP cache. And, uh, would not be treated as AMP alternates. If you have kind of the setup with the traditional HTML and the AMP alternate pages, uh, if you have errors in the AMP version, then we would not show those AMP alternate URLs in the search results. Uh, so it's not that there would be a ranking effect from that, but more that you're not getting the full value out of your AMP pages because we can't put them in the cache. We can't serve them uh, immediately when people click on them. Uh, it's, it's more of a usability kind of thing. It's like you're already doing a big part to make those AMP pages work, but they're not completely valid, so we can't actually use them as AMP pages. Uh, by mistake, I created a lot of tags, and sometimes uh, of the same name with the main category. It ends up that uh, the tag pages score better in the search results than my categories. Will the use of rel canonical help? Uh, so that I can send the juice back to the main category. How long will it take until this change is implemented? Uh, so, so sometimes it can happen that you have a lot of different pages on a site, and kind of the wrong ones end up ranking. And cleaning up the site structure makes it a lot easier for us to pick out which pages you really want to have shown in the search results. Uh, so cleaning up the URL structure means, on the one hand, kind of removing or reducing the amount of internal links to those kinds of pages, and on the other hand, using uh, technical elements like the rel canonical or setting up redirects uh, to point at the pages that you do want to have shown in the search results. So uh, in that regard, if you're kind of seeing that you have a bunch of similar pages and the wrong ones are ranking, then cleaning that up definitely helps. Uh, it can improve the ranking of those pages, because if we can concentrate all the value in fewer pages, then we can make those pages a little bit stronger in search. They can be a little bit more relevant. Uh, with regards to how long that takes, it's really hard to say. Uh, in particular, we have to crawl these pages. And on a per URL basis, we have to understand, oh, this is the same content. You have a rel canonical here. We should switch indexing to the other page. Uh, and on a per URL basis, that takes a little bit of time. Uh, the crawling itself also takes a little bit of time. And crawling is not something where there's a fixed time frame involved. It can be that we recrawl some pages within, I don't know, a couple of days, other pages within a couple of weeks. So <clears throat> that's something where it's really hard to say how, how long it'll take. Um, accessibility question. We're going to make invisible headings for some sections of our pages, for example, like main navigation, kind of highlighting how will Google understand that this is not cloaking. Um, so we probably would not understand that this is not cloaking, but 
this kind of hidden text is something that is super common on the web, and we essentially just deal with that. So that's less of an issue for us. Even if we were to recognize that this is kind of hidden text on a page, it's not that we would say, oh, this is a spammy page because it has hidden text on it. But at most, we might say, oh, well, maybe this piece of text here is not super relevant for this page because users never see it. Uh, so in your situation, if you have main navigation as kind of a heading for, for people who are using uh, kind of voice browsers, essentially, then people are probably not going to search for main navigation on Google to try to find your site. They're going to look for your actual content, which is something that would be visible there. Uh, so in that regard, even if Google were to recognize that this is something that is less relevant for your site, it wouldn't negatively affect the rest of your site. Um, we're facing consistent impression spikes on Google Webmaster Tools. Oh, no. That's a really old tool. You should switch to Search Console. Uh, usually, we average between 2,000 and 3,000 per day. On Fridays, it goes up to 10,000 on certain keywords. Any suggestion on what could be causing the impression spikes? It's is really hard to say. Like, on, on the one hand, this could be something that users are just searching more uh, on some days. And this is really common, depending on the type of website that you have, that you see kind of like a, a weekly cycle uh, through kind of the number of impressions that, that are taking place for your site, where you have either on the weekends a lot of impressions, or during the week a lot of impressions, or during the daytime, or during the evening. Um, these, these kind of cycles are really common. Uh, so perhaps you're seeing something there. Uh, what, what I also sometimes see is that uh, some of the rank checking tools leave behind traces in Search Console, and you also see uh, kind of side effects like this. Uh, for the most part, these are things that uh, we, we do filter out uh, in the rest of our pipeline, but sometimes they just linger on in Search Console a bit like this. Um, we, we're about to run an A-B test for metered paywall with different variations, so each variation and its paywall schema. Uh, we Im we're embedding the roadblocks through a third-party tool. We can't know which versions are aimed at which users uh, because it's on the fly. Is there an option to fit only one paywall schema uh, for all the different tests? Um, sure. So the the usual setup that uh, people do, at, well, at least the, the setup that, that I've seen, uh, is that they essentially provide this cable paywall markup for the, the version that, or in a way that matches what users would always see. Uh, so if there's, for example, a kind of a lead in that you would always show all users, and some users see more content, some users see less content, or some users that can see more pages, or some users see the paywall immediately, uh, then you kind of add the paywall markup in a way that matches what everyone would see, kind of like the lowest common denominator there. And uh, that way, we, we can understand that. And it's not the case that we need to have the 100% exact uh, correct paywall markup on all of these pages if we can recognize that there is a paywall markup there, then that already helps us to understand that, oh, you're implementing a paywall, and it's different by user type or by location or whatever you use kind of as parameters. And that's, that's totally fine for us there. Um, how do you test the structured data for specifically the paywall structured data? Essentially, you would use a rich results test like with a, any other kind of structured data. Um, I think the tricky part with some of these paywall implementations is that Googlebot, of course, needs to be able to see the full content so that we can understand what it is that we should be showing your site for. And with that, we should be able to see the, the paywall markup as well. Uh, so if you're showing the paywall markup, depending on kind of like the, the user there, keep in mind that probably users don't need to see the paywall markup. It's really important that we see it, though, especially if you're serving Googlebot the content and not showing it uh, to users in some cases. 
Um, let's see. Across so many sites, about once a week, I get a notification from Search Console that data vocabulary, that org, has been phased out. It's no longer actual issue for any of the sites, so I'm curious how long Google will store and process the HTML for. Uh, some of the pages that pop up had their last crawl up to three years ago. And even on the HTTP versions of the site, which have been redirected to HTTPS for even longer. Um, I don't know. Like once a week, that sounds pretty excessive. Um, I I thought we just sent out that notification like once for all sites that that were using it. So uh, if if you're watching this and can send me some details uh, of what you're seeing, is like that that would be really useful uh, because like I said, this notification is something that we should be doing just once uh, for the site. Uh, usually, with these kind of notifications, we focus on what we ha last had indexed for those sites. Uh, so it's less a matter of when we last crawled those, but rather like, oh, we know that this markup used to be on your site or is on your site based on the last version that we have indexed for your site. And then we'll notify you about that. Uh, and. Like I said, this should be something that should be like a one-time thing per site uh, rather than a weekly notification. And uh, it's mostly just meant to, to let you know that it's like, by the way, if you still have this here, you should probably switch it out. It shouldn't be like something that's like super annoying. Um, but if you can send me some details, then I, I'm happy to take a look to see what, what might be happening there. Uh, I recently tweaked the meta title and description to improve quality of the words and made it uh, more fresh, as I wanted updated for a while already. After I updated it uh, for one of the search queries, I noticed my site is being indexed with just that one word, that keyword search. Uh, that makes me worry that cert the, the rank might never improve again, as I recently saw a drop in ranking for that particular keyword before the tweak. Can you explain why Google Search can rewrite a meta title up to an extent where it only leaves one word as a meta title? Um, I, I suspect you're seeing something very specific, so it's really hard to say. Uh, but uh, it is something where we, we do sometimes change the titles of pages, in particular when we can recognize that the title on a page is perhaps not the most relevant one to show to users based on their current query. So based on the query, we can show different titles. Uh, based on the kind of title that you have specified on your site, we might show a different title. Uh, for example, if you have the same title across a lot of different pages, then we might assume, well, maybe this title is not so relevant for, for any individual page. Or if you have something really common and shared on your title, uh, like you just have home for your home page, then we wouldn't show home as a title. We would try to figure out, well, what is this home page about, and try to show something from that as a title. And uh, that's something, when we change the titles like that, it's not a sign that we're changing the rankings, that the site is not ranking for what it has in its titles. It's more that uh, we're just saying, well, like the, the title that you have on your pages is not something that encourages a lot of people to actually click through. Uh, so perhaps we should show something that is more relevant for your individual pages. If you're seeing this very often across pages on your website, then I would Take a step back and try to look at the titles that you have specified on your site, also the descriptions, maybe, if you're seeing it with this snippet, and think about what you could be doing perhaps differently to make it a little bit clearer what, what actually is a useful title here for users. Uh, so a really common example that, that I see where we do sometimes rewrite titles is if you just include a big collection of keywords. And you say, oh, I want to rank for these keywords. I will put them all in my title. When we look at that, we say, well, this is like a collection of words. It's not a description of a page. Uh, so maybe we should rewrite that. And uh, similarly, with descriptions and snippets, it's kind of the same thing. If we recognize that the snippet is 
essentially just a bunch of variations of kind of like SEO phrases you want to rank for, then we'll try to pick something either from the snippet that you have there or from a part of the page, and we'll try to show that to users when they search. Yeah, just a quick follow-up on that. Um, when uh, when Google starts rewriting titles, uh, is that kind of a good sign that you should make at them and try to improve them, and that will actually help you become more relevant since Google apparently doesn't think you're relevant enough? Um, I don't know if it would help you become more relevant, but uh, it would, like, if, I, I think it, what it would help you definitely immediate in kind of the, the short term is that more likely we will show the title that you have uh, on your page. And if that title is better in the sense that it matches what users are looking for, it matches their intent, then like, that gives you more traffic. And then indirectly, over time, it's like maybe those users recommend you and like, your site improves in ranking overall. But it's not so much that we would say, oh, this title is now good enough to show, therefore the website is better. No, I'm thinking in cases like, as you mentioned, maybe the title is home or something like that, and the title does play a role in how relevant that page is, and uh, you know you move it, you change it to red widgets. I don't know something that is more relevant. Then that shouldn't that lead to kind of uh, the page becoming more relevant for red widgets since you're now actually using those words? Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's, but that's kind of the, I I would almost say less common situation. The the more common one I see is someone where the title is red widgets, blue widgets, green widgets, all, all right. widgets. And it's like widgets yeah. plural singular kind of thing, like a title like that. And if you just change it to red widgets, then it it helps us a little bit, but like. Just including all variations of all keywords there doesn't make a page relevant automatically. OK. And, and just to be sure, when you're changing the title, does that mean you're actually ignoring whatever is in the HTML code per se? I mean, you're completely ignoring the user-generated title tag mm -hmm. when you're not? Okay. No, it's, it's really just uh, the title that we show in the search results. So it's okay. not that we say, oh, like we, we will skip this. We will not use it for ranking. It's just we, we don't show it for this particular query. Because it also depends on what people are actually searching. Sure, yeah. John, John is, it, is it query agnostic then? I mean, is it, does it change on the fly? Um, so can page titles and meta descriptions change to improve, what, if you like, search result diversification? So they pick something out and change the actual page title and meta description to sort of vary the results? I don't know. I don't know if we would do it to vary the results, but uh, we, we do try to use it in a way to better explain what a user would expect when they go there. So I don't think. It wouldn't change depending on the query, but it, but it, be, it would depend on the document rather than the query. That's what I'm saying. It, it would change based on the query. So that's, that's something that, that you often see, especially in, in a case where you have a very generic title, as like, like home, for example, for, for page. Uh, then you often see, depending on how you search, you see either home, or you see kind of a rewritten version, or you see a name of the company, or something like that. So it would change based on the query. Uh, but it's not the case that we would change the titles based on what is shown as titles for the other pages in the search results page. Right. OK, so it wouldn't be used in, as part of like, a collection of the top 10 or whatever, you know, just to sort of switch things up and make sure that there's a range of different types of results. Yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. John, John, regarding this, I have also seen one case where one page was ranking for three keywords. For two queries, the, the original title it was showing, but for third query, it was rewriting the title. So it is uh, all the time, it is not like very simple thing where we can go and just think like this title is not relevant. Sometimes yeah. 
it is like uh, we have to go ahead with the same title yeah. yeah i yeah i mean it's it's tricky we we've also discussed internally options like having a meta tag saying like i know what i'm doing always show my title kind of thing uh, but that's that's also really tricky, and uh, it, it makes things complex in, in various ways. We also uh, had a project underway at some point where in Search Console you could specify a title for like a handful of pages and say like I always want this title to be shown. And there also we we just noticed that there are lots of weird edge cases where showing a title algorithmically just makes it much easier for users to recognize that this is actually a good page to match the, what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria, I think you had a question. Or you raised your hand, at least. You're muted. We can't hear you. We, we can't hear you, Maria. Sorry, okay. <laughs> I was muted. Sorry, <laughs> again. So yeah, I did have a question. However, when Don Anderson asked her question, it kind of clarified uh, the question I had. However, um, one going back again to um, titles and description, sorry to ask, uh, maybe this, is, this has been commented before. Um, one thing. We are seeing, I work, as I said, with, with small businesses, and some clients uh, they do um, is they saturate because someone told them or, or something, they, they saturate their title or their description only with commercial keywords because they said it works for such and such person. For example, you can see in, in, some, in, in some websites like Christine Brighton, Flower Delivery Brighton, Wedding flower, Flowers Brighton. And, and just all that in a key, in, in a des description is still why still is I don't know if that is against practices I why <laughs> does that keep happening I mean people do it because they say it work is that against practices is there a, a, I just I don't know I'm, I I know it doesn't look right. When the clients come to me and and, and, ask, and and I see that the first thing I say, no, this has to change. It doesn't look right aesthetically. But I don't know. I just want to hear your point of view. Why? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, if I make sense. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, hmm. So it's it's not against our webmaster guidelines. So it's not mm -hmm. something that we would say is is problematic. I, I think at most it's something where you you could improve things if you had kind of like a, a better fitting title because we understand the relevance a little bit better. And the I, I suspect the biggest improvement with a title in, in that regard there is that if you can create a title that matches what the user is actually looking for, uh, then it's a little bit easier for them to actually like click on the search result because they, they think, oh, this really matches what I was looking for. Whereas if you're looking for, I don't know, Flower Delivery Brighton, and as a title in the search results, you see flowers, green flowers, yellow flowers, blue flowers, Brighton, and like all of the cities nearby, then you might look at that and say, well, is this is this like I don't know some SEO result, or is this actually a business that will will do a good job and and create some nice flowers for me? Uh, so that's something where I almost think it's more a matter of improving the click through rate rather than improving the ranking. Uh, and uh, if if with the same ranking you get a higher click through rate because people recognize your site as being more relevant, then that's, that's kind of a good thing. Sorry, sorry. I just know because I saw a comment saying something about uh, funeral flowers. And yeah, I thought, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I mean, it's not a, a practice I follow. It's just um, I wanted. Uh, the, the the reason I'm asking this is because normally I uh, I always send um, the webmaster videos to my clients and and I say watch for min minus x to set 
And this is a, a common practice I see with um, people that come from, that they launch their own website and they try to give it a go to their own, uh, they're learning SEO. Yeah. And one of the most common activities I've seen is saturating um, with keywords, titles, and descriptions. So, okay. Thank yeah, you. I think it's, it's really common tactic because mm -hmm. like we, we we say as well it's like we use the keywords in your titles as as part of our ranking mm -hmm. systems and then people say oh it's like then i need to add all keywords to my titles and then you end up mm -hmm. with something like that but uh, just because they are used for ranking doesn't mean that you need to put everything in there and sometimes i suspect the the bigger aspect is really the, the click through rate from search rather than the the ranking effect Especially for small businesses, it's like you, you don't have a lot of chance to to be visible in in search results in lots of places because you're probably more focused on your regional area, and yes. having a, a title mm -hmm. that is really good that matches your business mm -hmm. that's a lot more important than having all of the keywords in. There. Does it have the opposite effect sometimes, John? Yeah. How, how do you mean opposite effect? Well, if you see. You know, take the example that Maria's just provided of the of florist. You know, big florist uh, selling flowers in every town or city in the UK or the US or wherever. And all the page titles say florist in Brighton, florist in South Sea, for florist in uh, Hampstead Heath, blah, blah, blah. Can that sometimes, because they're kind of almost competing against each other as clusters, can that almost have the opposite effect to them ranking well and detract away from maybe just everything? Because they're all candidates all of a sudden for with very, very tiny variations. That's sometimes I think I see that sometimes on big sites. Yeah. Where they actually cannibalize themselves. With with different pages or with the same page? We're just competing with themselves with different pages, you know, with yeah. many, many different pages, with small variations, with page titles being one of the quite aggressive ones that there's not a lot of difference on, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's that's definitely something that that kind of happens there. And I think I, I mean, on the, on the one hand, I understand the, the interest in having pages for individual topics. But if the, the variations are so small, you're essentially just diluting the value of, of your content across those pages. And then you have a lot of pages for individual topics, but they all don't rank well, versus you have one page for a more, slightly more general topic, and it's, it's very well concentrated there then it's a lot easier for us to say, well, this is really competitive page for that topic, and we should show it more. So it's back to the old uh, fewer pages but better. Yeah, exactly. Are they, are they really competing against each other, those pages? So if, I mean, Flowers is one of the typical examples where you genuinely do need a geographic page because they might have a genuine network. Whereas a lot of these pages, um, you know, plumbers in and then name every single area within 200 miles. They're not. They're just doorway pages. But florists have uh, kind of the longest established e-commerce network anyway of that distribution method. And I think that goes back to what you were saying, that those pages aren't competing with each other and they're not competing for the main homepage title and description. They should be genuinely standing alone. Um, and florists have, if I remember correctly, they have the highest click-through rate of any e-commerce business because no one searches for it unless they're buying it. Does it, yeah. depend, does it depend on genuine network availability then? I, I think it's the point that Rob's making. I, I think it's probably one of those things where it depends as much as nobody wants to hear that, where you kind of have to figure out for, for your specific use case, is, is it critical that you have them kind of separated out like this? Uh, do you actually have unique value that you're providing there? Or is it something that you can combine a little bit more? I've seen this uh, happen with, for example, if, if you're a hotel site, 
uh, uh, people search for you know hotels in Zurich, but they might search for accommodation in Zurich, travel packages and everything like that. So I've seen sites kind of do individual pages for each of these just so they don't stuff the title with all of these keywords. Uh, but I think, and what I've been using as uh, as a, um, I don't know how good of a practice it, it is to kind of alternate some of the keywords in the title with some of the keywords in the heading. And I've noticed that Google sometimes, if you're if you're using hotels in the title and accommodation in the heading, and people are searching for accommodation, Google will sometimes just use the heading uh, instead of the title in the search results. If that makes sense. Uh, so is can that be a kind of a good practice to avoid kind of creating um, multiple pages for what it basically is the same user intent? Yeah, I mean the the other thing to keep in mind is that as kind of the the whole machine learning side expands and it's like it has expanded for a long time now. Uh, it's something where we we understand a lot better what these words actually mean. So yeah. especially synonyms, like you mentioned, accommodations and hotels, like we we kind of know that these are the same things, and you don't need to mention kind of those different words on on the same page because we understand it's the same thing. And I imagine for a lot of the city names, it's very similar, where we understand well these cities are right next to each other. So if someone is searching for one city. We could show content from the other one. Whether or not a user would click through and say, well, actually, I really need like a florist in my city, or maybe this city is across the border, and it's like right next to me, but I can't easily get there for whatever reasons. Um, so it's, it's kind of tricky there. But for at least for the synonyms uh, side of things, I, I think we are a lot better there. Yeah. Um, hi, John. I have a question. Sure. Um, with adult websites, it's very unclear which sort of um, schema is basically allowed there, because in some articles you mentioned that um, this schema is definitely not allowed for adult websites, but on the majority of them, it's just not mentioned. So how can an adult website do this? Should they just implement everything and hope for the best? Or um, how can we actually know which one is supported and which one not? For example, the live one. Um, Life is used a lot on um, blogs nowadays, on some um, podcasts. But adult websites cannot use live, but it's not written there that it's not supported. So how can we know? I I think in in our rich results guidelines, we we say like none of them are useful for adult websites. But okay, I I haven't checked recently. I don't know if any anything has changed there. But at, at least as far as I know, all of the the types of rich results that I'm aware of are explicitly like not not meant for adult content websites. Okay. Um, and I I imagine so so I don't think there is any kind of manual action or web spam action that takes place in in something like that. But it's more that our systems recognize, oh, this is an adult website. And it wants to show these rich results types. But since it's an adult website, we just won't show them. So it's not okay. like it'll be then, demoted or anything. Then I have a second question. Let's say that um, a company has an adult business and um, all these schemas are not supported. They launch a second business, which uh, features, let's just say, uh, no nudity. Um, but schemas are also not picked up there because Google still thinks that's an adult website. So what makes a website adult is my question. What makes a website adult? I, I don't know. So it's... Uh, it's one of those things that if you have to ask, you, you probably already know the answer. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, there's uh, let's say, a website such as uh, Twitch. I mean, uh, Twitch has all of these things supported. Um, let's say that we make a website like Twitch. It's, it's still not going to get picked up, and I wonder why. Yeah, so the, the thing is, I, I think with, with a lot of the safe search filters is we try to apply them to a kind of a broader URL pattern on, on a website. So if we see that the whole domain is adult content for the most part, and you have some small part that is not adult, then mm -hmm. probably we would filter the whole domain because right. it's just it's our system. Pretty much. Okay. 
Yeah. I mean, our systems are just kind of like we, we want to stay on the safe side there. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have individual subdomains where some of them are adult and some of them are not, that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, if you have separate domains, then that obviously makes it a lot easier for us to, to understand that these are completely separate websites uh, that should be treated differently. So it's so something we, we also see, I think, uh, some, sometimes with. By safe search, then it's adult, pretty much. Sorry? If it's filtered by safe search, then it's adult, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I don't think we make any clear distinction between like filtered by safe search and adult and porn or wh whatever the different categories are there. Uh, it's, it's mostly like we recognize it's filtered by safe search, and then probably we wouldn't show any rich results there. It, okay. it also happens the, the other way around, where uh, some sites might have, I don't know, classified sections, which are, which are for adults. And then if that section is embedded within the main website in a way that is hard to separate out, then we might say, well, we don't know how much of this site should be filtered by safe search. Maybe we'll filter too much. Maybe we won't filter enough. Uh, on the other hand, if you move that to a subdomain, then it's a lot easier to say, oh, this subdomain should be treated like this. The other subdomain should be treated differently. OK, understood, clear. Does, does, uh... Does Webmaster Tools tell you if your site is held under safe search? Does it? No. No. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's one of those things, like, probably you know if, if your site is, is really adult content. But if it's kind of like a tricky thing, then I've, I've also seen that happen, that they go to the forum. It's like, my site is not showing up in search. And then someone will say, oh, well, if you turn off the, the safe search filter, then it is showing in search. And then yeah. they try to figure out, like, how, how did safe search get confused? Or why is safe search so picky in this particular situation? Because it's, it's one of those things where like, different cultures have different thresholds, almost, of what they would consider to be problematic or adult uh, content. And we. I don't know. In our algorithms, we have to make some call somewhere. True. OK. Well, uh, did you, I don't know whether you saw that there was a case. Well, it was not really a case at least. Fabio um, from TransferWise did a little bit of an investigation into why something just suddenly just tanked. And he, he found adding expletives seemed to, <laughs> seemed to have a bad impact. Um, is that the case, John? If you, cause, Sometimes it's quite difficult to control communities, etc. And um, he, he found, I don't know whether it was just correlation versus causation, but when lots and lots of swear words got added to some content, it seemed to have a very adverse impact on the rankings. Is that something that might happen, or is that just correlation versus causation? Yeah. I I don't think that's something that would be by design. So maybe it's it's more of a side effect kind of thing. Um, also, that also if it's any site with a forum or comment section. I mean, literally every comment section in the world would. I know exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, it was just he just seemed to think that that was something that had impacted. Um, don't know. I. I don't know. I, I didn't see that. So, sounds interesting, though. Yeah, but I, I don't think that would be by design. Like Just adding uh, some curse words to a page shouldn't make that page less relevant suddenly. OK. Yeah, thank you. Cool. OK. Um, I have to jump off to another meeting soon. so. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll pause here. I have another Hangout lined up for next Friday, so it's not the last one this year. Uh, and uh, if any of you want to join, then like, feel free to jump on in. I think it'll probably be a little bit looser, because it's like last Friday before the holidays. We'll see. Um, but uh, thank you all for joining in. It's been really interesting, lots of good questions, lots of feedback also to pass on to the teams. And I hope you all found this useful. And maybe we'll see each other again one of the next Hangouts.
Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye John. Bye.